This special episode of the Bitcoin Show Conference Edition is brought to you by Mt. Gox. That's M-T-G-O-X dot com and bit-pay dot com. That's B-I-T-Pay dot com and Mezzy Grill, M-E-Z-E Grill dot com and Cablesaurus, Cablesaurus dot com. And then another thing is that recently, it's just an example from, from something I heard, is like, 
Middle Spikes coming out. Middle Spikes is like a, a hacker toolkit. And um, I was reading through the release notes and we're like, I was like, yeah, you know, we have this guy that said, yeah, there's a couple new cost exploitation, new modules uh, for dumping pass in OK. And oh yeah, they <laughs> support Bitcoin. So they, if, you, if you actually own any computer with Middle Spikes, it will automatically download all that if there's one in there. And so definitely the hackers are sort of scaling up the attacks. So we need some, as Kevin said, much more fundamental protection against uh, theft and, and loss. Um, so let's apply some common sense to the problem. So Bitcoin actually consists of several different components. The component we've already mentioned is the blockchain, um, which again is this data structure where all the transactions are open to. And then there's the UI where you just you know you have your address book and you may have like integrations with uh, exchanges that show you balance there. Uh, you enter transactions. You uh, whatever all the kind of stuff you can do with that. And then finally, you have your actual keys, right? So these are the things that, this is what you really have to protect. So if we look at the properties of these three things, like the blockchain is huge, okay? It's very, very large, and that's the main problem with it. It's also global, and it's public, so there's no big secret. Everyone can download it anywhere. Um, so because of these properties, like that should be on a server, right? It's huge, it's global anyway, right? and it's public anyway. So, that's something, why should everybody have a, have a copy of that? And you put that on the server and you let people query it. Like, you wouldn't download all eBay you know, auction offers just to like do one auction, right? You would just connect to the server that has all the data for you. Then the UI, obviously it's, uh, it's complex, so there, there could be all kinds of features. Like right now it's simple, but it's gonna get more complex in the future, I think. Um, and so, like, it can't, I'm gonna say later why that's important. So it's not as simple as, as something that we can predict how it's going to look in the future. Um, it's personal, so it, it doesn't. Everyone has a different um, sort of data in the UI, so they can have like a dress book and all kinds of stuff, and you have different people to trade with. And it's private; you don't want this information to be public. So obviously, you want to run this on the client somehow. And then finally, you have the wallet, which is very simple. It all it does is just store keys and, and sign things, and it's also personal; like that applies to you. And that's also something that we have to worry about because we have to keep it very secret. So ideally, you want to have this on a hardware device. So we want a device that, that never gives the keys away, and you just sort of send the transaction to the device and look, is it correct? And if it's correct, you say, okay, uh, I signed this. And um, <laughs> okay. um, so I was looking for a platform for the server, and. I, I have to say, like, in the beginning, I went with it with a pretty open mind. So I, I did look at Scala, and I did look at a couple other things. Um, I knew it, it was going to be a peer-to-peer mode, -peer, obviously. Um, it, was, it would have to be real-time, so it, it, it would have to be able to, if something happens on the network, it would have to be able to perform other components without any delay. Um, it would have to be, it would have to have a JSON RPC, just because I wanted it to be as consistent with the main plan as possible. And finally, it would have to maintain a lot of connections because if you have a thousand people logging into their wallet, you want to you want them to all be able to, to use it without any conflicts. And so, just because I mean, it already says it in the name. I said no, so I'm going to use Node.js. So it's just built exactly for this kind of thing. Um, and the other thing that uh, goes very well with Node is MongoDB, which is just a database. It's a, it's a data store, and I should say Node is kind of like a uh, it's an engine that you can run a JavaScript code on, and again, it's an engine that's built for this kind of stuff. Um, so, just for the developers among you, like everyone else can tune out for a second. <laughs> so, um, developing with Node.js, uh, I found it like it can be pretty strange at times. So, you find things like uh, somebody adds a little bit of syntactic sugar, and in order to do that, they sort of uh, there was one case uh, a library called Node Binary. And just so you could replay um, the actions or the methods that you run on that on, on an object, they stored everything you did for no reason in RAM. So sometimes you, you just go, <laughs> yeah, <that's it. laughs> So, but aside from that, the funded foundation is extremely good. Like, I was continuously impressed by the performance, by like how, how much more simple the development is, and just how much how quickly I was making progress. Um, but, and with how little code compared to the original client as well. So 
And the other thing, obviously, if you have you know, the server, you want to be able to use it, you want to be able to have UI, a wallet. So um, we also started writing a, a, GUI, a GUI for it. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, for that, you need some JavaScript-based cryptography, so you can sign stuff in the, in the client. And you need to be able to store the, the, the keys on the local uh, device. So we use something like HTML5 local storage. And you use something like server.io, so it's real time and it can communicate with the server. And this is the um, desktop version of it. And just in the last week, we also wrote a mobile version. We've actually done the first commercial transaction with it today. So Sheldon was uh, at uh, Basic Grill earlier, and he paid with uh, WebCoin you know, on his iPhone. And uh, I might go around and, and show it to you later, but it's kind of tricky because you know, like I don't have proper internet because my car is Swiss, uh, Swiss my phone is Swiss, so it's kind of complicated. But um, again, if you have an iPhone and an Android phone, just come up to me and I'll show you that. And uh, in the future, again, I want to secure the wallet more. So uh, one of the things that, that we were thinking about was uh, sort of a deterministic wallet. Again, I come from the perspective of I don't want to lose my coins. So not just I don't want to protect against hackers, but I also don't want to lose it myself. And the thing with encrypting a wallet is all you're really doing is you're removing it one step. Because what are you encrypting? You're encrypting a key. So what are you encrypting it with? With another key. So now you've got this encrypted key, and now you've got a strong key that you you know what I mean? So um, it's kind of just moving the, 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 the problem a little bit. And so one of the things that, that can actually help is um, you can have sort of a master key that all other keys are derived from. And so you can create as many keys as you want and only store the first one. And what that gives you is you don't have to update your backup all the time. You can do one backup and it'll be just current forever because every new key that you generate, you can always regenerate from the original one. Then the other thing that Gavin also mentioned um, is that you can actually split up this, the signing process. It's called the distributed key generation uh, in cryptography. And uh, there's algorithms for that for, for uh, DSA, which is the uh, of digital signature algorithm, which is one of the most widespread signing algorithms. And DSA is also applied to the cryptography, which is the signing algorithm that Bitcoin uses, so EC is it. And Probably you can apply the same things. I don't know if you've made any progress on it. <laughs> well, okay, well. Um, so yeah, so, and this is a hard to run problem, right? So somebody has to come in and do actual, you know, original cryptographic research. But once we have that, as Kevin said, you can actually use two software devices to get sort of a two-factor authentication. As long as not both devices are compromised, you are secure. And then finally, if you have a hardware device, like the little device with a display, where you can actually say, you know, send a transaction to the device, the device shows you, do you want to send X amount of coins to this address? You say yes or no. You say yes, it sends it back, and it goes off to the network. And that's all. That's all I can put in my heart. And uh, if you want more information, you can obviously go to our GitHub repository. Everything I've talked about is uh, open source already. Like, we've uh, pretty much, the first line we wrote, we opened this just the same day. And uh, if you want to follow the progress, you can also listen to the Twitter feed. That's probably, if you're not a developer, you can uh, the Twitter feed. And if you have a smartphone, you can actually try this out or prototype. Again, I have to stress that this is not right. But you can log in with your smartphone on uh, webcoin.ch and yeah, play around with it. Right. So there was already there was already a library for uh, what's called big integers, so big integer math, and uh, somebody had on, built on top of that a uh, elliptic curve implementation. And what we then built on top of that is the digital signature algorithm for elliptic curves. So so we we there was three three steps to were done for us, and we did the last one. Okay, so when you want to write a transaction, you have to sign it with an elliptic curve cryptography key, right? With an elliptic curve signature. And so the, the main or the main the, the most difficult function that you actually need to have is just the signature algorithm. Right? Um, all the other stuff like um, yeah, I mean like all the transaction format and so on, you can use uh, byte arrays. And then when you communicate with the server, uh, you can convert the byte array to anything you want, like base sixty four or whatever you want. Are you 
everywhere with product called uh, CryptoCat. CryptoCat? Uh huh. It's a JavaScript chat uh, based, web based chat system by Canada and TikTok. Perhaps they're using lots of the same kind of development here that you are doing. Uh, that's very possible. So the library that we're using, um, so the question was, do I know CryptoCat? Is that strong? Um, no, I don't. Um, but the library that we're using is extremely popular. So the, the JSPN library is extremely popular. It's part of the Chrome uh, uh, benchmark suite that they run against every single Chrome release. So it's actually, it's really well optimized and it's really, really well tested. So um, it was a great library. If that exists, it would have been really difficult. Any more questions? Right here? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the first time I heard uh, anybody working on this was Art Forbes, who said that in, he's one of the, the uh, one of the big miners, he played around with FPGA mining and so on, and um, I heard that he was sort of thinking about working on it, and uh, since then I haven't really heard anything about it. What we are probably going to do as the next step is we're going to develop a software implementation of that device. Now, that doesn't really, like, that sounds like, okay, you want a hardware device, so why, why are you writing it in software? But what you can do with that is you can define all the protocols, and then sort of you just, that the stuff you had developed in software, you just port it over to a hardware platform. And you don't have to define anything, and people can test already, and, you know, you can establish all the standards. Okay. Right, thanks for your time. Bitcoin enthusiast now I've uh, been uh, kind of uh, encouraged to uh, promote security, right? Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that I advocate now is uh, two-factor authentication, and there are a lot of systems for that. And so, uh, obviously, Knockbox being uh, the majority of, of the market share, um, it's very important. I, I noticed that one, one thing I figured out is that these USB uh, security keys are pretty much immune from viruses because if you're using uh, an e-wallet system, whatever, where the wallet file is not in your system, this is mainly for non-technical people. People who don't even trust their own skills enough to, to do all the steps that they have to do securely. You've got it out there on another system. You use a second, uh, what do you call it, two-factor authentication, and that it eliminates the problem of the keyboard capture uh, viruses and trojans because the password's only good for a couple seconds, if you know what that means. So anyway. Uh, Knockbox has one, a lot, of people, a lot of these exchanges have one. Knockbox has one called a YubiKey. So they, um, they've uh, asked me to, to say, for you guys who are watching or viewing or here, um, the first 20 people who send an email to me, uh, Bruce at onlyonetv.com, with a free YubiKey. <laughs> email me quick. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Really, really, really happy you're here. We'll see you in Thailand, in February. Right, yeah, that's what it's saying.
A special thanks to our sponsors, the first Mount Gox, mtgox.com. You know them by now. They are the largest exchange for Bitcoins. They are now taking the British pound, Australian dollars, and Canadian dollar should be here any day now. The euro is now here with the Bitomat acquisition. Mt. Gox mobile app is now on the Android market. It allows you to take Bitcoins on the go. And finally, with the USB security device, the YubiKey, it protects your account even on compromised computers. And brought to you by BitPay, that's B-I-T dash pay. They are the official uh, merchant processor for the Bitcoin conference. They allow you to accept payment in Bitcoin and receive US dollars instead. Super simple to integrate into your website. We did it. And finally, they allow you to generate QR codes, invoices, and more. Just a full inclusive merchant solution for Bitcoin. And Mezzi Grill, uh, where authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. They're now serving breakfast. They're right here on 8th Avenue at 55th Street in New York City, just a couple blocks south of Columbus Circle. They are the first brick and mortar to accept and sell Bitcoins in New York City. There are also worldwide franchising opportunities available and we did eat there for the conference and it was delicious. And Cablesaurus.com, that's Cablesaurus like a dinosaur. It's a quality and fastly shipped specialty mining gear, gaming gear, and PC supplies shipped directly from the USA. Free shipping is available. They offer the best gear for miners and gamers such as PCIe extender cables, GPU and PSU dummy plugs, riser converter cards, dual PSU cables, watt meters, and more essential mining gear. If you're a miner, you know what it is and you know that you need it. Thousands of satisfied customers in the Bitcoin community accepting payment in Bitcoin and dollars. Again, that's Cablesaurus.com.